Did you know that the church has enemies? I mean, some of these enemies are obvious, and some of them are not so obvious. And also, these enemies are both foreign and domestic. Really. Well, we'll talk about the ten enemies of the church. That's coming up next on Cutting It Right. Join me. Well, praise the Lord. I'm Reverend Michael Jakes, and thanks for joining us on the program today. We are going to talk about the ten enemies of the church. The Bible says that Jesus would set up his church and that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. So no matter how the enemy wants to destroy the church, the church will stand no matter what. But yet and still, we who are the church, we, his people, we need to be on guard and be aware of of the enemies within the church and outside of the church that are trying to destroy it. That's what we mean by both foreign Number and domestic. Number seven, it's formalism. Formalism is just the pretty much opposite, the pretty much opposite of emotionalism. And when we talk about formalism, uh, we're pretty much just talking about nominal Christianity. There are many people in the church who are professors but not possessors. There are many people uh, within the church who say that they are, but they are not. There are many people within the church who are haves, who are have-nots rather than haves. They speak well. They say that they are, but they have nothing on the inside. The shell is empty. And so these individuals, they look the part. They have a certain formalism about them. They, they look right. They sound right, they walk right, they act right in a in a church environment, but there is no spirit in them. You know, the Bible says that in the last days, men will be lovers of themselves rather than lovers of God. The Bible also says that they will not have the power that they say. They will they will talk as if they have power, but they deny the power thereof. They don't have the power that they speak of. They don't have the power that they claim. So we need to steer clear of this enemy called uh, formalism. Okay? It looks right having a form of godliness, as the scripture says in 2 Timothy 3 5. They have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. These people have an outward form that looks good and even fools some people. Once again, discernment. It's a form of judging. I have to discern whether someone is genuine or not. Just because they speak well, I. there needs to be more than their words. There needs to be more than just words. They're missing the most important thing, and that's the power of God on the inside, which is the Spirit of God on the inside. And if you're missing the Spirit of God on the inside, the Bible says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 9, whoever does not have the Spirit of God in him is none of his. And so we got to be very careful when it comes to this enemy called formalism. Our next enemy is a deadly enemy. And one of the deadliest enemies is called legalism. Legalism. Legalism is, is an enemy, but it's also a monster. It's a monster. Legalism brings bondage. And bondage brings fear. And this fear, then, it promotes control. You see, when I think, when I see something that I don't like, I try to stamp it out. I try to find somewhere in Scripture that says that that agrees with what I don't like. Now there are so many things within the Bible that we can pull apart, and so many different things that we can that we can uh, stretch. So many different things that we can misinterpret. We have to be very careful. We have to allow Scripture to interpret Scripture, and don't pull things out of context. When we begin to pull things out of context, we begin to read our own likes and dislikes into a scripture verse. And our own likes and dislikes should never go into the scripture verse. 
We have to read it for what it is. Sometimes a scripture verse uh, has to be spoken and taken in the historical context that it was given. The historical context that it was given. For instance, in Genesis 22 and verse 5, it says that a man shall not wear that which pertains to a woman, and a woman shall not wear that which pertains to a man. What does that mean? Now, in the in the historical context, he was there was no in those days there was no such thing as pants. That's what we immediately think of when we hear that. A woman should not wear uh pants, and a man obviously should not wear a dress. Okay? You can you can read that into it. But obviously, that's not what it was talking about at the time. But application can be made. So once again, we have to be very careful. We have to be very careful how we interpret certain passages. Passages in, I believe, First or Second Peter and also in uh, uh, Second Timothy that speak about how a woman ought to present herself, whether or not she should have braided hair and, and this type of hair, whether she should wear jewelry. All these things need to be taken in the historical context. Yes, they have much to do with a woman of today, but also you have to remember in the historical context what exactly it was speaking about. The Bible has scripture verse, for instance, about whether a woman should have something on her head. Some churches demand that a woman cover her head. Other churches are more liberal and they do not. I don't think there's anything liberal I don't I don't think there's anything liberal liberal about it. Some churches simply they interpret that scripture in another way. For instance, also, some churches wash feet. Other churches do not. It's a matter of interpretation. So, once again, we have to be very careful about how we interpret scripture. But legalism, this is all falls under the heading of legalism. Legalism is the effort to try to be holy. Legalism is the extreme effort to try to make sure that everything is holy just the way it's supposed to be, based on certain interpretations in the Bible. You can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this, you can't do that. If you don't do this, then you can't do this. If you do this, then you can't do this. All of this is extreme legalism. Extreme legalism. So we need to sort of need to steer clear. If we sense legalism, if we see legalism, it's going to mess with your head. It's going to bring you into bondage, and it's going to put you in fear, and it's going to bring you in control of the legalists. You have the legalists, and you have the legally. Those are two words that don't exist. Rather, legally doesn't exist, and both words are not in the Bible. Legalists, legally, they're not in the Bible. But a legalist is a person who promotes legalism. And the legalee is the person under the thumb of the legalist who is afraid not to do the wrong thing, afraid that they do, they may not be wearing the right thing or saying the right thing because the other people, the legalist, is going to come down on them. Got to be careful. Got to be careful when it comes to this monster called legalism. Steer clear. Steer clear of legalism and legalists. Steer clear. Next enemy is worldliness. Worldliness. The world is in direct contrast with the minds, the thoughts, the heart, and the will of God. Can we all get along? No. The church cannot get along with the world. But what's happening, unfortunately, what has happened, the world has encroached into the church. The world is in. Not coming in, not trying to get in. The world is here. The world is in the church, bold. The world has almost taken over the church with all the different fads, with all the different things that are in the church. The world has come into the church with a furiosity. And it's not good. We have performance now within the church. We perform. And we dance, and we have talent shows, and we have fashion shows, and we have all of these types of things within the church. And it has nothing to do with the gospel. Nothing to do with 
bringing lost souls to Christ. Nothing to do with helping someone who is feeling down, depressed, discouraged. Nothing to do. It's a pastime. It's something that we're doing. It's fun. Concerts galore. There's nothing wrong with a concert. There's nothing wrong with ministry if it's done in the form of ministry. But there are so many things happening at concerts. Artists are trying to sell their product and artists, different people are trying to sell other things. It's it's a place of promotion. And, and, and I think sometimes that in some concerts, I think if Jesus was here, he would be there and he would be overturning the tables in some cases. Because what's going on has nothing to do with the preaching of the gospel. And that's what the church ought to be about. That's what the church ought to be about. And so this thing called worldliness has invaded the church. It has come in. And it has come in hard. The devil wants to draw believers away from Jesus and draw them close to the world. As it pertains to profanity, um, I've heard ministers of God, and I put that in quotations, ministers of God, I've heard them use profanity from the pulpit. This, this, this can't be. Sweet and bitter water come from the same fountain. This cannot happen. This cannot happen. What is going on when men of God, men and women of God, use the pulpit and speak profane things? Profanity. I'm talking about profanity. The profanity that you've heard before, that you know, have no business standing up on God's pulpit speaking those words. When it comes to music, the world has invaded the church. Okay, certain music, you can call it what you want, but certain music, and this is an arguable statement, certain music probably does not belong inside of the church. I'm not saying everything has to be slow, demure, blessed, assured. No. No, everything doesn't have to be that way. But there needs to be a certain respectful, reverential display of worship. Music ought to bring you into the presence of God. Music ought to make you think about the goodness of God. See, we're so caught up in praise, and praise is a wonderful thing. Don't get me wrong. Praise is, praise is something that we don't do enough. But when we allow music, the type of music that we have nowadays to dictate our praise, I think sometimes it helps us to get into the flesh. So we have to be very careful. We don't want the flesh to rule and reign and dictate. We want the Spirit of God more than anything else. And so this thing uh, called the world uh, has invaded the church, even when it comes to fashion, what we wear. We have to be very careful. The world, the world has come in. Okay, there needs to be an obvious difference between the church and the world. It's a different system. It has different nature. It has a different ruler. Everything should be different when it comes to the church. It should be different. But now, you can't tell the difference. There's no separation. There's no division anymore. We talked earlier, what's in the world? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. That's what's in the world. Okay, so making, my, making myself a friend of the world causing me to be an enemy of God. That's a powerful statement. If I'm loving the world, if I'm embracing the world, that makes me an enemy of my God. So I have to step back. I have to step back from this thing called the world. No, as Paul says, we don't have to go out of the world. But we have to remember that we are in this world, but not of the world. We're here. But while we're here, we need to occupy. And we need to occupy properly. Occupy doing the right things.
the world more and more is saying things the more the world is is dictating more and more what the church should do and this should never be the case finally we come upon our final enemy of the church and it is none other than false teaching false teaching this is at the base this is at the foundation of all of the enemies because what you believe will dictate how you live what you believe will dictate what you do if you believe certain things then you're gonna let certain things go false teaching it's dangerous dangerous okay the Bible says in 2nd Peter 2 1 but there were false prophets among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. Okay? A true teacher is going to speak the truth in love. A true teacher is going to be, might be hard on individuals and on things, but they speak it that way because there's a concern, because there's a love for truth. Don't Allow yourself to be embroiled in false teaching. And unfortunately, there are some teacher, some teachers, as it says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, that are speaking lies. Lies. But the only way you're going to know a lie is to arm yourself with the truth. This goes back to our first enemy, the closed Bible. You got to read it. You got to learn it. You got to know it. Else, you're not going to know when a lie comes. You're not going to know when a lie comes. Just as the body needs to be fed with healthy food, so the soul needs to be fed with health, healthy teaching. Okay, the Bible calls healthy teaching good doctrine. A good pastor and a good teacher is going to feed his believers with healthy teaching. Good, wholesome food from the word of God. A false teacher on the other hand, is going to feed people with poison. False teaching. So, once again, it's very necessary. It's very necessary that you arm yourself with the truth. Okay? There's a belief that people, one day, all people are going to be saved one day. Okay? Uh, this is the doctrine of inclusion. Everybody's going to be saved one day. No, everybody's not going to be saved. There are going to be some people who will go to hell. Okay, this is not, the Bible says that he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But there are some people who are hardened in their hearts and in their minds, and they will not have it any other way. And so it is not the Lord that's sending them there. People will send themselves to that place. Okay, so there's no such thing as the doctrine of inclusion. Everybody's going to be saved uh, one day. We know that the Jehovah's Witnesses, which is a cult in itself, they believe that there is no hell at all. We know that there is a hell. And anyone who believes otherwise is greatly deceived. Okay. Um, to be saved, a person has to keep the Ten Commandments. It's another teaching. No. No, the, to keeping the Ten Commandments is not going to save you. The law the purpose of the law is not to save. The purpose of the law is to point you toward Christ. The Bible says that the law was a schoolmaster to lead me to Christ. So keeping the Ten Commandments, doing good, being moral, is not going to be good enough to get you to heaven. Okay? There's one teaching that is very prominent nowadays. That says that we don't need to, as children of God, we don't need to confess our sins anymore. The Grace Revolution. Popularized by several television preachers. We don't need to ask God to forgive us no more, anymore because we are the righteousness of God. And though there is truth to that statement, there is no truth to the statement that we don't need to bring up our sins to God. 1 John 1 9 was written to Christian people. We use it to speak to those who are not saved, and it, there is an application there. 
But John, the writer of 1 John, was writing to Christian people. Those who believe that we don't have to ask forgiveness for our sins simply say that that verse was not talking to Christians. He was talking to Gnostics and it wasn't talking to Christians. He's speaking to Christians. Let me go to 1 John 1 9 before we close. John, 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 9. It says, If we, who's we? Who is he speaking to? Who is he speaking to? He's we. He's speaking of himself as one of the we. So he's not talking about Gnostics because he's not a Gnostic himself. He says, if we confess our sins, he's admitting that we are going to have sins ourselves. If we confess our sins, he, the Lord, is faithful and just or righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what Jesus does for the Christian when we sin. When we sin. Not if we sin, when we sin. If you're sitting, watching me, or listening to me right now, and you've never sinned, and you're going to say you've never sinned, you've already sinned because you have now lied. You have sinned. And any sin is an unforgiving is an unforgiving sin. So make sure you ask the Lord to forgive you for whatever sin you've committed. Good child of God, put it under the blood. Put it under the blood. He will forgive. It's gone. It's gone. Erased. Not just behind his back. Not just thrown into the sea of forgetfulness. Gone. Erased as if it never happened. That's how he sees our sin once it is cleansed. It's gone. And so these are the enemies, the ten enemies of the church. And these are enemies that have infiltrated and maybe will continue to infiltrate the church. However, as we have spoken, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Jesus Christ is the foundation of the church. And the enemy, Satan, though he walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, he will not diminish or destroy the church. Can't happen. Can't happen. Amen? Well, this is Reverend Michael J. This has been Cutting It Right, and I pray that you've been blessed today. And join me next time as we once again cut it right. God bless you.